We made this. Just take a look at my life now. Take a look at my dreams. Look up to the sky now. It's not what it seems. Hello everyone and welcome to Pick Up A Podcast, the podcast about podcasters and podcasting. My name is Kurt North. As ever, I am here to have a look at another podcast that's in the realm of the internet. And this week, it is about movies. It's good to be back talking about movies. We've had quite a few musical ones uh, on recently. But this time, we're going to be looking at movies. So I'll introduce him now. It's Travis, and you, Travis, have a podcast called Wait You Haven't Seen. Uh, Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, just before we do begin, do you want to give us a, a brief um, overlook on just what your podcast is about and uh, and how, how it got started, really? Sure, absolutely. So um, my show is called Wait You Haven't Seen, and it's a podcast about movies with the hook that one person every week had never seen the movie before. So, And it's usually something that's you know somewhat surprising. You're having a conversation with somebody, you find out, wait, you've never seen Die Hard? And, yeah. you know... It's it. I love showing people new stuff, and uh, it's always fun to me to see somebody's reaction to something for the first time. And so that's sort of what started this. So it actually got started. A friend of mine and I were having a conversation, and it was Highlander. He had never seen Highlander before, and it was the type of movie that was kind of right up his alley. You know, it was sci-fi, fantasy. He loves that kind of stuff. He just never watched it. So we got talking about it, and that was just sort of the the uh, genesis. And now what I do is I, I do a rotating group. So I have different people come in every week. Um, sometimes it's me that's never seen the movie before. Sometimes it's uh, one person that hasn't. We've had weeks where everybody has never seen the movie before. Um, and it's it's a lot of fun. I've only had one so far that uh, wasn't universally liked. So I'm, I'm, I've got a pretty good track record there. I think we've all, all of us probably in the world have had that, that story to tell, haven't we, the way you, you, you realize someone hasn't seen seen a movie i know that my um drummer who's who's since left us recently he had never seen or and still hasn't seen back to the future which uh which i find that's, quite 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 that's quite astounding incredible. <laughs> yeah yeah um and i think your one of your guests recently was he wasn't doing this show but it was jaws that that was an, another one which um which is quite quite amazing as well but um because of because of the the way that your your film podcast developed were you doing anything before this podcast? We did you have anything um, in line? How, how did why why podcast? Why did that come into into the realm for yourself? How, why did you decide to do that? So I've done a little bit of kind of everything throughout the years. Um, I in high school it got started with uh, projects in uh, in our classes doing video. Um, I also did uh, you know like mass communications classes and radio classes. Um, that went on to um, public that public access cable um and uh we did um some friends of mine and i did sketch comedy for a few years doing that i had done um college radio djing i just enjoy i enjoy talking and uh conversing and having good conversations so it was sort of the the mixture of like i'd done a little bit of work on a microphone and then all the years of sitting in a diner in the middle of the night drinking coffee talking movies and TV shows and music and whatever whatever would come up. But movies for me was always kind of a passion. I just enjoy film and filmmaking. I wanted to go to film school at one point. It didn't work out. It's probably for the better uh, in the long run. But it was it's just the type of thing that um, I really enjoy doing. And I'd been wanting some kind of a creative outlet. I'd gotten creatively stagnant uh, since we stopped doing the sketch comedy show and kind of adult life got in the way where – I was spending a lot of time uh, working, and I just didn't have the free time to do anything. And I've been wanting that creative outlet. So I'd been talking about doing some kind of a movie discussion podcast for probably five years. Uh, right, but okay. it was it was always the type of thing where I needed at least one other person to be a part of it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do a one mic show. Um, and I never had the the that other person or those other people that were consistently going to be able to do it. And I finally just said, you know what? Wait, I've got a lot of people that sort of can, but they don't all have to make a commitment. So if I have a rotating group, and it started out with just a small group of my friends, you know, and a couple of them would be available one week and a couple would be available the next week. And it since kind of exploded. Um, I started just about a year ago now uh, with the show officially. And... Back in September, um, I got asked to be on 
a uh, show called America's Next Top Podcaster. Um, and it was a kind of American Idol style competition show. Oh, um, okay, yeah. So it was 12 contestants, and every week we would get a challenge, and we'd have to come up with a 10 to 15 minute or 5 to 10 minute podcast based around that challenge. And so we'd be in teams, and we'd have to work together, and they'd switch up the teams and, and all of that. And that was probably the best thing that could have happened at the time because it gave me a fresh influx not only of creative outlets because I got to I got to try doing things that were outside of my wheelhouse. It wasn't just movie discussions anymore. I had to do full-on production. We had to do music and a bunch of stuff that I don't do on my show, um, as well as I got to meet two dozen more people that were all part of this, and it became almost like a family. All of us still talk. I've had almost everybody that was on the the show with me um, on my show at one point or, or coming up, um, but also just kind of that networking, it really gave me a new um, just pool of uh, amazing people to work with and new shows to listen to and get new ideas and just really got things rolling for me. So I've got, I've got some other projects that are slowly getting into the works right now as well. I think it's interesting that you say about the, the fact of, of networking and, and almost creating a family because I th- a lot of people have that kind of theme when they get into um, this kind of sort of medium. Uh, I mean, I've not been doing it for that long, as, as many listeners will have heard. That, you know, I've done it for, I keep saying 18 months, but I'm, I think I'm going to say 18 months for the next four years, <laughs> which is the way it tends to go. But I, I would say just oh, just maybe around two years now, maybe just over. Uh, similar to you, I, I've you know been in, I've been in a band, and you know, I naturally, when I'm even at work, I work in a culture and arts centre, so there's often times when I have to do performances or, or you know, not necessarily performances but be in front of people and be on stage and introduce people we've had you know major um, people come over from from guest stars from uh, motorcyclists who, who who were well known in the UK especially that we've had you know uh, bass jumpers and and, and all mm-hmm. kinds of um, people like that that come to come to the, the actual center itself um but when we, when the, my friends are quite a small pool of friends, but when I started podcasting, I found that that developed over time, and the there's a lot of um, camaraderie and a lot of people, like minded people that you kind of get to know, and and as this um, network that I'm on, that we made this network grows, you find that more and more, especially with the people that you've uh, that I've spoken to over the last the last uh, few months uh, over as as this um, this network has grown so i think that's really important um point, uh, uh, really important to point out that that, that is really uh, a good focus for uh, the reasons why we do podcasts and you develop those friendships and, and obviously they do they do last in the in the in the twitter sphere and the internet and and wherever they, that may may happen and to be able to bring in um especially um different podcasts to be able to bring in other people that have got the same interests is really interesting so mm-hmm. I'm really interested to, to delve into the more of the some of the stuff that was involved in those um, in those small things. So you're saying like sort of producing the music podcast and stuff like that. What what really tested you during during those weeks that you were on there? What what was the kind of the hardest part for, for you? That's something that was completely out of your comfort zone. Honestly, for me, one of the the more difficult parts of it was um, structuring a show and doing a more produced, professional, polished type of show. My my show weight you haven't seen is very conversational um you know it's sit down with two three friends and we just go back and forth round table style so it was nice to it was it was challenging but it was a good challenge to have to do things like really pay attention to pacing to editing to um production and as well as you know music bed and how to set the music bed in there and uh, writing writing was another big one because the better we could write we we had such a short period of time we had anywhere from five to six days from concept to completion um and you know all of us are we we work uh full time so it was you know you have to fit it in where you can and we had to do it at night and in the evenings and you know all of that so it was preparation and writing was a a really big one that made me kind of stretch a little bit and kind of go back to um sort of the sketch comedy days and some of that improv work uh to to get ideas going and then from there um just scheduling it actually that was the other thing uh that it probably did more for than anything was it got me to focus on scheduling and 
really plotting ahead. So, right, yeah. um, you know, I used to kind of come up with the idea for what movie we were going to watch or who was going to be on the show. Sometimes as little as two days ahead of time. And now I'm three, four, five weeks out and um, really plotting ahead. And so it re- really helped my organization as well. Okay. So with regards to the organization, do you do it in, in with what you've learned from there? Do you tend to have like a rolling program of that you're ready to record that you do so many things within like a week of such and such, but then you develop in the idea for the first one or is it more um, organic than that? Uh, it's more organic than that. Um, for weight you haven't seen, it's very, like I say, it's very much um, pick a movie, and go, pick a movie watch yeah. it, and then sit down and talk. Um, I have a, a rough idea of the topics that I want to go over, um, the things that I want to talk about, but I also want to let my guests kind of take the reins and go in the directions that they want to and see where that conversation can go. Um, but I have another project I'm working on um, that's still very, very early stages uh, that is going to end up being a full-on um, radio drama. Um, so that is going to take a lot. That That's going to be a while um, because there's a lot that I still have to do just to even prepare for that. Uh, you mentioned about pacing as well that, that, that you learned. That's something that's um, just just the word that you said there. How, how, how did that kind of develop then within that? How does the pacing kind of come into the um, to the podcasting? Obviously not so much on yours, but on, on the actual competition. So what you find is, um, especially if you have multiple voices, like our, our first uh, challenge was an introduction. Um, so we and and every week in that those challenges had to be it had to feel like a living podcast so it couldn't just be a one-off it had to feel like it was part of a feed of many whether that was the first one of many or it was somewhere in the middle and what we found like right off the bat was 10 minutes is not a lot of time when you have four people that need to talk and so you what you really find is how to hit those beats how to get something that's going to keep the audience interested in whatever it is you're talking about because and and one of the best bits of feedback we would get from the judges is why is anybody listening to your show what is the what are you getting what are they getting out of what you're doing so it was being able to find the the rhythm to hook somebody get them to listen to what you're going to listen to without holding them for too long and losing that interest um, and that was a, it's a very delicate balance in there uh, on top of just having to edit out all the uhs and ums and, and all those types of things that we do as humans when we're talking, I do a terrible amount of. I think you're not alone. <laughs> um, yeah, I think a lot of people do that. I tend to, I think I mentioned this a few times, so it may well get edited out, but um, I tend to um, say the same thing twice or like the, the, uh, do a lot, of, mm, do yeah. that a lot. So, um, but yeah, I mean, those, those things are, are, are sent to try. So what about your podcasting as a whole then? So you've, at, at the time of this recording, I think we're up to, you're up to around episode 51, which I think with last episode was Baby Driver. I haven't yes, heard that one. I did listen to some of Close Encounters of the Third Kind uh, oh, recently, so I remember good. that one. I think the Terminator one is another one that I listened to recently. Mm-hmm. Um, with the fact that you know you've got these these um, episodes that that you know, kind of develop the way that you want to develop them, how do how how does the the actual recording go? How how do you do you record in person? Do you record over uh, a particular program, and how do you collate that that um, that recording together before you actually start to start to start to do the edit. Um, so I would love to be able to record in person, and I have um, some of the hardware to be able to do that. Unfortunately, I don't have enough, and I don't have the space to do it. So that's sort of a goal down the road is to be able to have a space where I can have people sit around a table and talk. But in the absence of that, and because half of half or more of the people that I do this with are in various other parts of the country or sometimes across the, the globe. Um, what I, I do all my calls and all my recording through discord. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So I set everything up in discord and then, um, I actually live stream the recordings. So I run everything through discord into uh, Streamlabs OBS. And then I, I push that out to Twitch. So all my mixing is done right there. It, I, I'm the laziest producer possible. <laughs> uh, I hit record. We get done. I trim a little bit. If there's something that definitely needs to be cut out, like I had, um, actually it was in the Terminator episode that you mentioned, uh, my dog decided halfway through it that he had to go outside right that minute and started climbing on me. 
so I cut that bit out. But for the most part, uh, I let I do sort of all my um, technical stuff right at the beginning of the stream. Make sure my levels are good. Um, make sure everybody can hear each other, and uh, we're not too loud, we're not too quiet. And then just hit record and go. Um, now sometimes that that fall or that fails me. Um, I had one episode I had to scrap because the way my mixing board is set up, when I'm prepping for the show, I'll capture audio clips from the movies to occasionally play. Okay, yeah. And um, in order to do that, I have to flip a switch on my mixer to push the audio back through so I can record it. Right, yeah. That button happens to be right behind a knob, so I can't see it. So I forgot that it was on, and it caused an echo that I couldn't remove. And so I had right. to just scrap the whole episode. It was It was probably 40 minutes of an hour-long episode had it. And the thing is, I don't hear it in my monitoring. So well, It's interesting because I've done uh, – I've recorded from Discord as well, slightly different to the way that you've done it, as in like pushing it via OBS and, and Twitch. And that's certainly – we're always up for trying to find new ways of, of recording uh, episodes because the um, – just, you know, the, you might catch on to a gold mine. I know that some people are starting to use um, – likes of chrome online and things like that mm-hmm. i think on the when we recorded discord i did it with matt latham of pick a disc who's on our network and uh, the the premise is really good and it it works and i think that i just fell back because of time and issues of trying to really get to understand it and to fully know it but there was a, I did a two or three recordings that way and i thought that 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 worked really well and it's got quite a few decent um, you know, as as you say, you be able to to mix stuff, but it's also got some nice um, sound enhancements and things that that's within Discord itself. And I think we use a, a bot on on ours for recording. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a couple of those, um, and I'm interested to try those out too because they uh, one I saw will record everybody as a separate track. Yeah, and then allow you to uh, do your edits and mixes from that, which would be great. Um, it's more yeah. work than I do currently, but I kind of like the idea of it, and I kind of want to play with that too. Yeah, I mean, as I say, it definitely works because we did we did it for two or three episodes, I think. I think we recorded one for definitely, and I think that I might have used the Discord recording for two or three episodes uh, of whatever podcast I was doing at the time, just from my end, just as a as a test, as a uh, as a backup. And it it did work really well, and it is interesting to 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 do it that way. The um the way that the podcast, the way that this bot on mine, I can't remember what the bot was called now. I'll have to have a look and put it in the show notes. But the way that the bot worked was that, as you say, it records different tracks, and then at the end you can choose how you want it downloaded. So you can download it as a flack, yep. you can download it as multiple tracks within Audacity, and it will literally download as a, a a zip file as soon as you open that zip file all the tracks are within audacity and it's oh, all synced nice. up ready to go so um i'll definitely look up what that was called and i'll put those in the show notes for everyone but that that is definitely uh, an, an interesting interesting way to go so with all your guests do they do they have to have discord and, and twitch themselves or are you are you getting the feed from them and then directly recording on twitch how, how does that work for, with your guests uh, so everybody's will be on Discord, um, but then Twitch I take care of. I, I do all of that, just push it out. Um, and quite a few of them do their own Twitch channels now, um, as it is, so they might um, you know, co-host. But for the most part, no, I, I take everything, run it into to my system, and then uh, push out the, the Twitch thing and do the recording. Um, you know, there's another one that we used in uh, for America's Next Top Podcaster, and it was similar. You were mentioning like Chrome type stuff. It was called ZenCaster. Yes, I've heard of that one. And yeah. ZenCaster is a brilliant idea because it allows you to everybody's recorded separately, but they're all recorded locally, and then they upload afterwards. Um, the problem that we ran into with it, and uh, it would happen occasionally. It wasn't so bad for us as the uh, voices, but it was a, a real pain for um, our producer. Was you would get a lot of audio drift, and right? Okay. He it, it, it was a struggle at times, um, but it's a brilliant concept. So I, I do like stuff like that, and I've tried a few different things. I just I have found that for my particular show, the way that I do it now, um, it's just easier. You know, I I in fact. I even do all of my audio um, production type stuff. I run off of an iPad, and I run that into my mixer. So I have a little uh, cart app 
and I can just load up whatever soundboard carts I want and have them at the touch of a button. So I can hit record, start hitting buttons on that to play my audio drops and my intros and everything like that. Um, so it's very much sort of a, a live to tape or radio style um, yeah. that I do. So, so effectively, just for, for everyone, everyone listening, so you, it, that iPad will have all your sounds within within that app, and then you just hit the button when it's ready, when you're ready to play in that particular thing. Is that how that works? Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, with regards to the actual content, um, do, do you with the the type of episodes that you do? You say you, you talk about um, the film, and, and obviously people bring different things to the table. Do you have a, a length of time in mind for how long you'd like the podcast to aim for, or do you? particularly aim for a time or do you just let that run and has there been any particular times when you know it's either been way too short or you've just gone on forever and, and had to cut it down or or you've just left it as is how has that cut gone over the past 50 episodes or so um so i shoot for roughly an hour uh, i feel like that's a pretty good amount of conversation you can have and you can touch on a lot of different topics um but it's going to be wholly dependent on the movie as well. So um, we have had, we had, uh, I think the episode for The Emperor's New Groove was a little short. I think it was only came clocked in like 40 something minutes. Uh, but it's a short movie and there wasn't a ton to talk about. But it also depends, that, that particular episode I had, um, my guests were just, they're not, they weren't the most talkative people. So they would have very short or very simple answers to everything. And Rather than try to just let that drag on, we just, you know, uh, I called an audible and we ran it short. I've had a couple episodes that have gone an hour and 20 minutes because you don't really realize it. You're going along. So I, I don't have a hard stop. I try to aim for about an hour and I try to keep an eye on the recording and see, okay, we're, we're coming up on it. Let me sort of wind the conversation down, give them a chance to plug whatever they have going on and, you know, let people know what's coming up. And, but I've also had times where I don't even realize I get so into the conversation. I think it was the King's speech recently. Uh, we ended up like an hour and 15 minutes because, and, and that was simply, I looked down and I was like, we're at an hour and 10 minutes already. And I didn't even notice it. Yeah. So have there, has there been many of times that that's happened? I've, I've had that occasionally happen when you just, you just look at the time and go, Oh my God, that's, <laughs> that's been, it's been 40 minutes. I, I can't believe it's been, been that, that long already you know it's it has been many times that that's happened to yourself and i would say ones. um just about every week honestly i will start the the show we'll get going i'll take a glance and i'll see we're about 15 minutes in and think to myself wow it's going to be a we're going to have to really stretch to get close to an hour with this and then the next thing i know we're at 45 minutes and i have no idea where the time went because we've just gotten rolling and we're talking about and, you know, conversations go, you're going to go down some rat holes and you're going to go off on tangents and that's just going to happen. So, um, you know, I try to try to keep things to the movie that we're watching, but inevitably um, you're going to get some side conversations, uh, whether it be other projects from the same director or actor or something to do with that uh, particular actor uh, in the current climate and and all sorts of stuff like that. So, yeah, I would say just about every week um, I lose track of time and I'm surprised when <laughs> when that happens. The films that, that you haven't haven't seen, has there been any particularly um, ones that people have been surprised that, that, that you haven't seen, being that, that you're into your movies and um, is there still ones to come that to, for people to look forward to that you will do in the future where it is quite surprising that you haven't seen that particular film or have you got quite a few in the, in the locker? Cause there is thousands of films, isn't there? So, Oh yeah. Uh, that, and, and because we don't have a restriction on genre or era or anything like that, we really just have carte blanche to do whatever, whatever movies we want to. And ones that surprised me that some other people I knew hadn't seen were, uh, I mentioned Die Hard earlier. Um, Princess Bride was one that I was really surprised that uh, Don, who had been on with me, hadn't seen it. Um, Because usually what I get with somebody who hasn't seen uh, a movie like, say, Princess Bride, that's very, very well known, is they're young. Right. Right. It was before their time. They hadn't seen it. Don is older than I am. He had just never watched the movie. Um, A couple that had surprised people that I hadn't seen um, were a couple recently. um, Monster was one with Charlize Theron, 
and oh, uh, yes, yeah. the King and the King's Speech that I'd mentioned. Both of those are um, fantastic movies, and I, I usually try to watch a lot of the Oscar-nominated films every year. Yeah, just happened to miss those. Um, the other one, and this was the one that surprised people probably more than anything, was I had not seen The Dark Crystal. Right. Okay. And the funny thing about that was, I thought I had. Like, I had memories from that movie. I quote that movie occasionally. And I sat down to watch it. I was on my way. I was actually traveling for work, and I was on my way back. And I thought, oh, I'll watch The Dark Crystal. And I start watching it, and I realized, never seen this movie before. And so that became the movie for that week. <laughs> that was, I was like, well, I'm, I'm doing this because I have things to say. I love Jim Henson, and I love Muppets, and I love Frank Oz, and I love all the people that were involved in it. And somehow I had never actually seen the movie. Right, that's interesting. Like, because obviously things like um, Labyrinth was around that time as well, and I know that during my my youth, that Dark Crystal was a, a big favorite of my my friends, and I was more of a Labyrinth person. Um, mm-hmm. So it was it always it was almost like uh, you know I, I I like this one, you like that one kind of thing. And uh, right, and it's right. great. That, it's great that the new se- that new series on Netflix is out. I haven't seen that series yet, but that's um, definitely oh, I I saw the first bit of it, and it's phenomenal. Is um, it right? Uh, I mean, I'm a sucker for practical effects and Muppets and puppets like that. There's something to seeing those things and knowing that it's really there in front of you. Yeah. Um, that just blows me away. So Yeah, and I think that, that a lot of movies are, try- are trying to go back to the, the kind of practical effects as well, which I always think is it's always nice to be, as you say, grounded in, in that. I haven't seen The Mandalorian yet, but I believe, obviously, the... Uh, the little Yoda kind of character is, mm-hmm. uh, is, a, is a puppet, which is great, which is great to yes. see. Yes. Yeah, it, it's great to see that happening in, in film and television again, um, using the computers for kind of what they should be, which is extensions yes. of what you're doing, not the whole thing. Yeah, and a lot of it, a lot of things that I really like about, as you say, extensions of whether or not, you know, it's adding a, just a little, a little effect like a bit of snow or something like that, which is it, it, not even noticeable. But it just gives you subconsciously the, the the natural feeling of the of the film uh, that you're watching really works really well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I for a lot of reasons, and I, and I can't get my head around it. For example, I mean, I'm a bit a bigger TV fan, and I am a movie fan. But um, Babylon Five just didn't work for me because of the effects in it. It was just I know it was very you know of its time, but even of mm-hmm. its time, it was like no, don't like the sales and don't like this. It's too computer generated for me. Um, or like the Matrix, for example, um, in Matrix Reloaded. So I love that fight scene with Agent Smith in the middle of it. <laughs> but it, when he gets to about six minutes and then Keanu becomes this computer-generated movement when he's using the pole and things, it's just like... Oh, yeah. It's yep. just, it's, there's, there's a switch. The, the fight scene is absolutely incredible to that point, and it just pushed it too far for, in, in that direction for me. You could argue it, you know, it takes a different stance because it is the Matrix, so you can push it a little bit more. But I still think that the practical effects up until that point work really well. Yeah, and and that was why the first Matrix I think worked better was there was a lot of technology involved and a lot of groundbreaking technology, but it was still based in a lot of traditional filmmaking. And that's what you're seeing now is a swing back to more traditional styles of filmmaking incorporating all this digital work Um, because these digital artists are phenomenal and they can, they can create stuff now that looks so much better than it did 20 years ago, but they're using it in a way where they're not, they're not trying to create it out of whole cloth. They're, they're taking something that's, that's there and augmenting it and making it better. And, You know, David Fincher is an example of a filmmaker who uses computer generated and uh, visual effects a lot in his movies. And you wouldn't ever guess that a movie like Zodiac would be so effects heavy because it's the slow moving detective drama. But he uses so much of it to create the world because he'll shoot San Francisco and then make it look like San Francisco in the 1970s. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff that that's, you know, that's. That's art, and that's the just wonderful type of filmmaking, um, and you're seeing more and more of that. As we get into the you're, you're up to episode fifty, do you see? <laughs> you mentioned about the films, and you can choose whichever genre you want to do. Can you see yourself doing this for 
uh, a, a particular length of time? Are you just going to go until you feel like you've um, exasperated it? And do, do you ever have a break or anything like that at all? Or do you just go straight through every single week as you are? And you're on 51, so you've almost done a year. Um, how, how do you see the future of the show? Honestly, I don't plan on um, stopping anytime soon. Um, I will go as long as people will listen and as long as I can have other people that will uh, join me and have conversations with me. I do foresee at some point probably taking um, a break just because doing it every week can be difficult. But honestly, because of the way that I do it and because of the um, style of recording that I do and the the fact that there isn't a ton of uh, production involved in it makes doing it every week a little bit easier. Because it's just me sitting down with some friends every week to talk. Once it's done, it's done. It's just out the window yeah. and then, then back on to, to air in it. Yeah, so really the only thing that I can see getting in the way of uh, of continuing to do it weekly and not missing any weeks is going to be things like life getting in the way. You know, I have a, uh, a trip coming up in a few weeks and um, I will be probably about the time that this airs. Um, I'll be me- actually meeting with a lot of the people that I've done this show with um, in Las Vegas. So, you know, what what I'm hoping to do at some point is kind of bank a few um, canned episodes. Yeah. Um, get a few things either maybe not the traditional, hey, let's sit down and watch a movie, but might, maybe something more akin to almost like a, um, a riff tracks or a mystery science theater of like, hey, let's find a cheesy movie and let's all sit down and just watch it and talk about it. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, something like uh, – I watched a movie on Netflix a few weeks ago called Doom Annihilation that was uh, not good at all. (laughs) Um, And that would be the type of thing that I would watch again, but I would watch it again with friends and and make fun of it um, type of thing. So that might be the kind of thing that I'll I'll bank a few of those. That way if things come up and I, you know, maybe I take a holiday or, um, you know, I have a, a big life event happen. I've got something that I can put out and at least keep the cadence going and keep the show going so that people that do listen to it have something. Just as you, you mentioned that you've got very little, little post production that you do, but what's involved once you've recorded the show and how do you get it onto the, onto the internet and how do you kind of um, store all your, all your podcasts and, and then um, publish it to the world? How, how does that all, all come together? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I started, it as my own website um, purely out of the fact that it was the least expensive way I could get started. Right. Um, I could start up a website for, um, because I I'm knowledgeable enough in web development and um, how to run uh, computers. I could set up a site, have it go um, without any problem. So it cost me a nominal amount of money every month. Um, the show is still small enough that bandwidth isn't an issue. I don't have enough downloads for it to be a problem with my hosting provider. Um, so what I do is I take the show and, like I say, I live stream it on Twitch. Um, so it's, it's twitch.tv forward slash TV's Travis, which TV's Travis is sort of um, – it's nice because it's unique enough. I can get it just about anywhere. Right. So if you ever see that name on a platform, it's it's ninety. 90- Five percent of the chance it's me right um and so then what i do is i take the recording of that um i strip out the audio uh, i usually trim off a little bit on the the beginning and uh, a touch on the end um i'm part of a stream team so i throw a, a couple of sounders at the the end of it and then i just upload it to the website and i have a podcasting rss feed plugin um so it's just create a new post um get the the audio in there and schedule it for when I want it to go live and that's it. Um, so right now that's still the easiest way to do it. Uh, I, I eventually will probably have to move to a different hosting provider as, uh, I get more episodes and I start to run out of space or I can, I can increase the storage space that I have. Yeah. So, um, really what it'd come down to is bandwidth. Um, or if I start doing more than one show. Uh, but for the most part, I mean, it, it's a simple, um, you know, it usually takes me, oh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes after a show is done, I can have it, uh, after I'm done recording it, I can have it ready to go. That's, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially when, um, you know, we, on my Make It So podcast that I do with uh, with Tony Black, 
on the on Star Trek Picard, which we're currently doing at the moment, which should have just about finished when the time this comes out. Um, that you know the, the turnaround on that is really really tight. That we can be recording. Or, well, I'll take last week for example. That I will re- I recorded it at around this time. So as we speak, it's um, ten past midnight here. I think it must be um, six seven o'clock your time somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I recorded it, woke up the following morning, edited it, and then got it uploaded uh, pretty much by 11 o'clock the following morning. So I had three or four hours of, of just edit, tightening it up and, and getting the other side of it, EQing it and things like that. So with yours being um, pre all that, that you know, you're just able to just throw it up is uh, is really good to, uh, to to think about and to see if, if it's at, at all possible. It works differently for different people, as I say, but I think yours definitely feels like, you know, it is a conversation and the way that it naturally flows, it, that it does do that. And as I say, you, you know, a couple of tweaks here and there, then it's great. And it, it really is dependent on the show. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if I was trying to do something more akin to like a, uh, you know, say a radio lab or This American Life or some of the... Um, you know, the, the more polished shows, there would be a lot more turnaround time um, because I'd have to actually really edit and really, really work that down. But the conversational nature lets me um, kind of feeds into my laziness uh, a bit <laughs> and, and allows me to um, put it out that way. But I, I know I've got, pro- you know, like I say, I've got the, the radio drama um, style project that I'm, I'm working on right now and some other ideas for shows that I would like to do um, that will involve more of that production. So, a, you know, a weekly cadence may not work for that, a bi-weekly or uh, something along those lines. Or if the the other way to do it is um, if you know you want to release weekly, you just plan ahead and get a lot of stuff done ahead of time and then start releasing them. And I think of reactionary ones as well, the... You- the um the fact that you are reacting to something you may have only seen like two or three hours beforehand that there is a lot of thought process behind it and you know mm-hmm. getting all gathering all your thoughts for it and then just <laughs> just exploding out full of information going ah well yeah. so there's uh, there's quite a bit of editing to do with that which is which is interesting so yeah. yeah we mentioned your website so where where can people find that um that website and as you say you mentioned the Twitch thing again just to to reiterate where people can find your streams and do you have it as do you have the streams on at a particular time um mm-hmm. for, is it like a regular kind of timing that you do use it for sure yeah um so the live streams of the recordings are typically sunday nights um 8 p.m eastern time in the u.s um so i don't have the conversion to utc in my head i think it's like middle of the night um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that's that's when we record, um, and that's twitch.tv forward slash TV's Travis. Um, I'm on Twitter as TV's Travis, um, and my site is TV's Travis.com. Um, the joke we like to make is that uh, I just have a gigantic ego, so everything has to be named after me. That's fair uh, but really, really what it was is I registered the website before I had the name for the show. Right. Okay. And then I named the show Wait You Haven't Seen, which is a terrible name, and it's hard to find. So I just push people to my website and say, find it there. The RSS feed is there. There's a button right there to uh, load it up in Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. Um, maybe at some point I'll put myself on like Stitcher and Spotify, but those are those take more work. And uh, like I said, I'm lazy. So <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, so also as well, you mentioned about the um, the TV drivers. Do, if if you if you, just before we finish, do you think that? Um, if you do do these future ones, like you, the radio one you were talking about, that you would just use a TV Travis as your umbrella and have different shows within within the uh, that umbrella as such, or would you think about doing a separate kind of thing for them? I I have a feeling that I would probably lean towards having TV's Travis as sort of the umbrella, and that's the brand. My I would I would use that as the brand, and then I would have the different shows underneath that. Um, I've put a lot of work into kind of getting that name recognized, so it would just make more sense to do it that way. Yeah, and it, well, as I say, it, it it definitely caught my eye on Twitter, basically. So <laughs> hence the reason why we're we're talking today. Um, no, but thank you very much, Travis, for for coming on. Just one final thing before we mm-hmm. before we go, I saw on your Twitter today that you you are moving house. So my question would be, is where do you record right now, and where do you foresee yourself recording in your new home? And uh, I hope the move goes well. 
Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's exciting and nerve wracking um, buying a house. So <laughs> I, I both recommend it and tell people never do it. Um, right now, I have my setup uh, in the current house that I am renting in the basement. Right. Okay. Um, and I, the new house, I will actually have uh, a nicer room um, that I can uh, I can set up and have some more sound um, acoustic paneling in. Right. Um, but it'll be the same thing. I've got, uh, I just have a little kind of command center I set up and um, get my uh, my microphone and my mixer and everything and and go with it from there. But uh, it'll it'll still be in a basement room, but it'll be a nicer basement room. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. So yeah, and uh, you can find me currently on the Make It So podcast. That's on at Jean Luc Podard, which is a uh, podcast on Star Trek Picard, the show that's will be either just finishing or has just finished so that's a show that we've we've been covering we've covered the books the comics and the 10 episodes of star trek picard so if you're into star trek that's where to find me Uh, i've been on quite a few couple of episodes over the last few weeks of the x cast as well which is also we made this podcast network podcast so you can find that there and returning in the very near future or might have just returned as we speak there is the Millennium podcast, the 90s TV show Millennium, and you can find that at the Time Is Now pod. So, yeah, so thank you very much again, and until next time, listeners, remember to listen back to the um, the little clips that we've got from the We Made This Podcast Network, which is what we're part of. That's coming up right now. But until next time, keep listening. Previously on the We Made This Network. won't forget me. This film is often, and rightly regarded, as one of Joan's best. Here she gives a performance, under the guidance of Q-Core and with the support of worthy co-stars Douglas and Beat, that shows her very soul. Her eyes are like luminous liquid windows to her heart. There is no glamour here. It is all about the story, about Anna Holm and her need to remove herself from a past that has been one solid mass of black. Make it so, a Star Trek Picard podcast. I do think the the gap between Freaks and Breaker probably isn't that huge either. Because yeah, I know things I agree. like the love of jazz and stuff was all him. Various things that he brings into the character. The love of cooking must be him. You know, yes. and, and it's something yeah, that yeah, yeah. brought into Riker, especially later on, you know, is the, the controversial Enterprise final episode he took on the role of the chef so he got to do some you know, food prep and, <laughs> and this is what he spends a lot of this episode doing as well which I thought was hilarious it's, <laughs> the last time we saw him he was you know he was making food and now he's doing it again <laughs> this, is, this is what Riker does now you know and I feel like that <laughs> might, got... it might be a freaks thing yeah probably The Giddy Carousel of Pop before we clamber aboard the carousel, Hannah, could you tell us a bit about why you chose this particular issue? What what jumped out when you were looking through and deciding which one to choose? Well, there were two main things, um, Chris and Neil. No, the Pet Shop Boys cover, I absolutely loved it with the sailor hats. And um, it was, of course, Neil Tennant that made me want to work on Smash Hits. I went in and told my teachers that I wanted to go and be deputy editor like him. And they said, don't be so stupid, just go into teaching. It's never going to happen. But fortunately, I ignored them, so that's good. (laughs) But the other thing, I can remember getting this issue so clearly. The other thing was there's an interview with Michael Hutchins, the most beautiful man that ever lived. And the the one-page poster, it's just exquisite. He's all curly hair and smouldering some... He's, um, yeah, it's just amazing to see him in there. It was like, oh, who's this? What's going on? Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This Podcast Network. Pick Up A Podcast is created and hosted by Kurt North and is part of the We Made This Podcast Network. It can be found on Twitter at Pick Up A Podcast. Music for the show is created by David Kennedy and produced by David Kennedy, Kurt North and Ian Curtin. Check out the We Made This Podcast Network on Twitter at We Made This Pod and on Facebook by searching We Made This. There is also a website. Check that out at www.wemadethispod.com. Thanks for listening.